In this video, we're going to give some very good uses of interfaces in programming. I'm going to start by going through an overview of what interfaces are and some rationale behind why we use interfaces. And then we'll take a look at a hands-on example in Android. Now, this concept can be used in Java, in .NET, in C++, in Android, and many other languages. I'm just using Android as an example. So let's start. Why use interfaces? This is something that really confuses people who are introductory programmers because it feels like just an extra layer that's not adding a lot of value. This is especially true if you've learned programming by yourself out of a book and you have not worked with others. Indeed, interfaces are some of the most valuable things we can use in object-oriented programming. Back in 2000, I took a training class from somebody who was considered just a real genius in object-oriented programming, and he told me two things that really blew me away. Number one, he said you can judge the quality of an object-oriented program by counting the if tests. The fewer if tests, the better. Number two, if you are not using interfaces, you are only using half of Java's potential. When he said that to me, I realized I use if tests all the time, and I never use interfaces, so I must be doing something wrong. And I committed myself to figure out what I was doing wrong on my own, and about nine months later, it all occurred to me. So some of those learnings is what I'm going to go through in this presentation. So first of all, when we say interface, we're not saying a user interface or user experience. We're talking specifically about the programming structure called an interface similar to its siblings, class and enum, and interface is a programming concept. So if you're here for user interface, this is not the video for you. So what is an interface in programming terms? Well, it's really just a list of method signatures. That's it. It's a contract. It says, if I implement this interface, I agree to implement these method signatures. For example, if I have an interface iPet, and iPet has something like eat, a method, a method called eat, so we'll say public void eat, uh, we'll terminate that with a semicolon, then the class dog, which implements pet, has to have a method eat with an open and closed curly and some kind of behavior. So does the class cast, the, the, the class cat, it also needs an eat method, and the class fish needs an eat method because you see they all three implement this interface ipet. So in a way, an interface is like a contract because any class that implements it has to provide some behavior for these methods. One other nice thing about interfaces is that a class can implement multiple interfaces because all it's saying is, I agree to provide behavior for any methods that are defined on the interface. If more than one interface defines the same method, no problem, the class only has to implement it one time. Now, because classes will implement an interface, many times we will put javadoc, or in other words, some comments, on the interface and the methods of the interface itself. When we do that, we can simply reference that, that javadoc from the implementing classes. We don't necessarily have to repeat the javadoc unless there's something materially different in that class from what the javadoc indicates on the interface. Okay, so... Why use interfaces? Number one, polymorphism, which we, each of these will talk in detail in the next few slides. Polymorphism is one of the four main pillars of object-oriented programming. So abstraction, polymorphism, uh, inheritance, and encapsulation spells out an acronym API. Those are what we consider the four primary tenets of object-oriented programming. So we know it's a contract. Here's a big one. A parallel development when there are unknowns. Sometimes when we're doing group work, we have dependencies on each other. I might have a dependency on somebody else, and that person might not have all the information he or she needs to do his or her job. If that's the case and that person slows down, then it slows me down as well because I'm waiting on that person. But if we enact a contract first, and then we come up with some kind of mock or stub of that contract, then I can continue doing my work as the DAO person is doing his or her work. Okay, so we can, uh, another thing we can do with interfaces is if a class implements an interface, it can be passed into a method signature where the method signature has a parameter variable of that interface type. 
we use it frequently in Android for callbacks. So something like uh, I want to connect to location listener or I want to connect to a GPS service. Once it's connected, it will call me back and say, okay, I have made the connection with this third party library. I'm ready to start delivering location information. So that's a callback. We request some behavior. The behavior takes some amount of time. When that time is up, when that time is finished, then the external process calls us back and tells us that it's finished. Interfaces are used for this quite a bit in Android. One other place where we will use interfaces is in test-driven design, because test-driven design means we write the test first, then we write the code. When we're using test-driven design, we can write our tests against a contract, and then the test will only pass when that contract is implemented by a set of classes. Okay, so let's start with polymorphism. This is a word that maybe you've heard of, maybe not, but even if you haven't heard of it, you might understand the concept. So in polymorphism, a variable type tells you what methods you're allowed to call. The object type tells you what will happen when you call those methods. For that reason, a variable type only needs to be a list of methods. It does not need to contain behavior. So we'll go back to my notepad plus plus here. And if we take a look at dog, many times we're tempted to say dog d equals new dog. Many times we see this and we just kind of think, oh yeah, that's how it works. Uh, so this is our variable type. This is our object type. According to the rules of polymorphism, the variable type tells us what methods we're allowed to call on the variable d, where the object type tells us what will actually happen. Now because that variable type is just telling us what methods we're allowed to call, could I make that an interface that dog implements like ipet? I sure can, because we know since dog implements ipet, it has every method defined in ipet. Therefore, this construction works out fine. As a matter of fact, the advantage of this construction is if I get rid of my dog, which I'd hate to do, I love my dog, and I get a cat instead, I can sw simply swap out the object type because both dog and cat implement the same interface. That means they both have this method called eat. I don't have that option if I've hard-coded the variable type to dog. So you see, I get one more, I, I get a, a bit more flexibility when the variable type is an interface because the object type simply needs to be any class that implements that interface. But if I have it as a class, then we're a bit more restricted. If I have it as a class, the object type can either be the same type as the variable type or a subclass of the variable type. Let's consider mammal. See, dog and cat both extend mammal. So mammal is the superclass. This is fine. Mammal D equals new dog. I could also say mammal d equals new cat because both dog and cat extend from mammal. But can I say mammal d equals new fish? No, I can't do that because a fish is not a mammal. Ah, but can I say I pet d equals new fish? Yes, I can do that because a fish does implement I pet. So you see an interface gives us a bit of flexibility uh, where we don't have to refer to the class itself or a superclass but we can have something that ties classes together, classes which otherwise would be unrelated. And the big thing is this, as long as the variable type is the interface, the object type can be any class that implements that interface. When we go back and look at polymorphism again, we look at the definition, we realize object type tells you what will happen when you call those methods. We realize this actually gives us quite a bit of flexibility and extensibility, especially for writing software that will be extended by other people. Okay, a contract. So when complete, my object implements this interface, my object that implements this interface, will provide a definition for these methods. A contract. Easy enough. Now a contract is really valuable when it's a contract between team members on a team, because we're saying, I might be the UI person, Joe Bloggs might be the DAO person. The contract is how I know I can call Joe Bloggs and the information that Joe Bloggs knows he needs to furnish to me. Parallel development. This is a story that I see a lot in programming mobile devices, especially uh, with a group project and one that's fallen behind at the end of the semester. So, okay, well, what went wrong? It looks like you don't have a lot to show. 
Well, the UI person tells me, until Joe Bloggs finishes the DAO, I can't start on the UI. And Joe Bloggs didn't finish the DAO until the last week of class. So I go to Joe Bloggs, and Joe Bloggs says, well, yeah, I couldn't finish the DAO until the last week of class because you didn't cover, say, JSON until the last week of class. And so both people feel that they're innocent, but the reality is the project was not delivered on time. What I recommend in this case is that the UI developer and Joe Bloggs have an interface that defines their contract. We know that we're not going to know everything we need to know on day one, and that's okay. We just need a way to work with that. So what we're going to say is, here's our interface, here's our contract, and we're going to write a little mock or a little stub against that interface so that the UI person can continue to make progress as the DAO person is also making progress in parallel. They're using this contract as a golden nail. Callbacks we talked about a little bit. We'll see this more as we get later into the semester. But essentially, if I have a method called public void register and it requires an unconnected listener type, an unconnected listener is an interface, as long as my class implements unconnected listener, I can pass an object of my class into this method. Uh, something we'll see quite a bit in Android programming. And finally, unit tests. So with unit tests, we know there's a lot of value to writing tests first because we don't forget to write them. And also, we know when our program is done because it passes all of our tests. But the trick is, how can you write a test against a class that doesn't exist? Well, you don't have to. Write it against the contract. So write the unit test against the contract and then let the developers uh, write classes that implement that contract, or in other words, classes that implement that interface. And those classes, when written, should make the unit test turn green. We'll have some videos in just a moment that cover behavior-driven design with uh, unit testing. But first of all, the example I want to show in this video is how we can use our contract uh, to have two people work in parallel. So I have, this is, a, we're looking actually at a screen capture of a previous video that I made, but nonetheless, we have one package with user interface and one package with DAO. Take a look here. You see this is an interface called iPlant DAO. You see we have a stub and then we have a JSON implementation. So do, two different classes that implement this interface, iPlant DAO. Let's see how we can use this in real life. Now, one trick is that interfaces are easiest to demonstrate uh, with an actual program. And we haven't written a huge program yet. So what I've done is I've rolled back to a previous semester, essentially a completed project that I demonstrated, the same one I'm demonstrating this semester. So I've rolled back to a previous semester. This was uh, spring semester of 2018, it looks like. But nonetheless, you see we have an interface called iPlant DAO. Notice we have, I could probably beef up this javadoc a bit, but we do have javadoc above our method. And our method, uh, let me pop this into present, okay, pop that into presentation view so it looks a little bit easier. The method simply returns a collection of plant objects and it accepts a search term and it throws a couple of exceptions. A very straightforward method. Take some string search, return a collection of populated plant objects, okay? So I'm going to go to the screen that uses this, which is GPS a plant. Now, uh, let's take a look at GPS a plant, and we're going to roll down to the method that uses this. And again, this is a completed example from, from a previous semester, but nonetheless, we only need to look at a very simple line here. Uh, take a look at this line number 374. Look very closely because you see the interface is the variable type, and the stub is the class type. Let's take a look at the interface. That looks familiar, doesn't it? Now we go back to GPS a plant. Let's take a look at this, this class, plant DAO stub. I click there, and you see it's called a stub. We could also call it a mock if we wanted to. If we scroll down, notice that it is creating two different plant objects. One is an eastern redbud. The other is a common pawpaw. And then it's returning those plant objects. Now, theoretically, we would think fetch would go against some data storage me mechanism, maybe a database, maybe a JSON stream. But at this point, we don't know how to do that yet. If we take a look at this method between line 20 and line 38, there's really nothing Android specific about this. 
This is a method that's just plain old Java. Here again, programming assignment one, phase one, that's what I'm asking you to do is implement an interface and simply uh, put in hard-coded Java as a stub. It's the easiest of all three phases because all you need to know is how to start Android Studio and how to write a little bit of Java. You should already know how to write a little bit of Java uh, to be in this class. So uh, that's a really good assignment, number one. Nonetheless, uh, let's go back and take a look now. This is going to fill in the autocomplete here on this Plant Places application. So I'm going to click in Plant Name and I'm going to start typing Circus and take a look, Circus Canadensis Eastern Redbud. Now if I start typing Eastern, note that I get the same result. I don't get Eastern White Pine though, okay? Because Eastern White Pine is not one of the classes I've hard-coded in to this, uh, to this stub. When we go against an actual data feed, we should get Eastern White Pine and a bunch of other Eastern uh, named plants. Now, if I say Paul, Paul, I start typing Paul and you see that comes up. If I type, uh, let's say, Oak, nothing comes up. That's because we're going against our hard-coded limited data set. This is something maybe we did in phase one. We said, here's our contract, here's our implementing class. Okay, so sprint one's over, sprint two, Sprint 2, the developer and the DAO layer says, okay, I'm starting to get a hang on this. I, I think I got it going. I, my unit tests are passing. I'm looking pretty good. Sprint 3 comes along and the user interface person says, okay, great. Is the uh, actual implementation of that iPlant DAO ready? And the DAO person says, well, gosh, yes, it is. It's called Plant JSON DAO. So take a look at this. Notice that I am the user interface person. And notice that I'm simply changing the object type on this line 374. I'm not changing anything else about the program. Because remember, the variable type tells us what methods we're allowed to call. So I don't need to change this because the variable type is staying the same. The variable type is our contract. The only thing that's changing is the object type. Here again, remember polymorphism. Variable type tells us what methods we're allowed to call. Object type tells us what will actually happen when we call those methods. So I'm going to pause the recording for a moment as I compile and redeploy, and we'll take a look at what's different. Just a moment. And with the magic of video, we're back. Uh, take a look now. I've simply changed line 374. I've simply changed uh, the object type. Nothing else has changed. And by the way, if you use something like a dagger uh, for Android or Spring, for a traditional Java, this construction of an object doesn't even happen in code. It typically either happens by annotation or in a configuration file. So you don't even have to recompile to change behavior like this. But take a look, let's see what's different. If I start typing Eastern, holy smokes, look at this. Look at all of the classes that have, or sorry, all of the plants that have Eastern in it. If I type Redbud, take a look. I get about 13 different Redbud plants. If I type Pawpaw, I get a couple different pawpaws. So you see that we're going against live data right now. And I think the other one I had was Oak, wasn't it? You see that we're, we're actually going against live data and all we have done is switch that object type. If we dig down into this plant JSON DAO, we see it's going to hit some kind of JSON stream here and then it's gonna go through and it's going to do some parsing. So this is the knowledge that the DAO programmer picked up over the course of the semester. And in the Sprint 3 said, okay, my actual implementation class is ready. Mr. or Mrs. UI, can you please take out the stub and put in this implementation? So that's the value of interfaces. Um, one other thing I will say about interfaces, and that is a lot of people say, well, I don't use interfaces because it takes too much work to write them. Really doesn't take much work at all. If you prefer starting with a concrete class like this network DAO, have at it. You can extract the interface later. Simply right-click, choose Refactor, Extract, an Interface, choose the methods you want to put in an interface, uh, choose the interface name, I might call it iNetworkDAO, and choose Refactor, and voila, there you go. You see it automatically adds the implementation line. It automatically, um, let's see, we'll go ahead and choose yes there. It automatically creates the new interface, iNetworkDAO, does all the work for you. So if you do prefer writing the class first, that's fine, you can still do it. So this gives a few good reasons why we want to use interfaces. I'm curious what you think. 
If you have any uh, agreements or disagreements, put it in the comments. I'd love to hear what you say. Thank you.